All right, HS Game Time coming at you from Centennial High School in Corona, and we're breaking down the Big 8 League. I'm Pep Fernandez. This is EPJ, Eric Paul Johnson. Eric, when you talk about the Big 8, it starts here at Centennial High School. The Huskies have dominated this league for so long. In 2011, do you see Centennial continuing what they've done uh, for the last, uh, I mean, since they've been around, right, with uh, Matt Logan at the helm? Right. I mean, I think right now, right, you'll see Centennial being the league favorites coming in. Will it be as easy as it was last year when they outscored opponents by an average score of 60 to 12? Not quite, but a lot of key players from that team that made it to the state bowl game last year are back, especially on the defensive side of the ball in Milo Jordan and Nata Tui Alamaka and their offensive line, one of the biggest in the area, led up front by Leo Lafayette, a six foot four, 300 pound tackle. So definitely big size, big strength and depth galore here at Centennial with the players they have. A guy gets hurt, they can throw someone in, if someone graduates, someone just steps right in. Yeah, we, uh, you spoke with head coach Matt Logan uh, prior to this interview, and he said he had over 100 kids. He had to go to double numbers already. Mm -hmm. uh, he said reload, not rebuild. It's reload right. because the skill guys are gone, but you mentioned the big guys are up front, and they've got a lot of talented kids, right, to, to fill those spots. Yeah, definitely. One of the guys in that skill position at his back is Romello Goodman. He got a lot of playing time last year because of the lopsided scores he got into games. But he's been battle tested. He got into that state bowl game and in the second half rushed for 100 yards against a Palo Alto team that won that state bowl game. So even though he's five foot five, a guy to definitely keep an eye on. He's going to be hard to find behind that big offensive line. I would expect a lot from him. I know he's, he's you know, small in stature, but uh, the kid has you know, great, tremendous competitive fire and a big heart. He uh, is about 10 or 15 pounds heavier. A little stronger, a little faster, so uh, we expect big things out of here. Especially we think uh, what's a nice advantage for him being so little is he hides behind those big guys. He kind of just squirts out of those little cracks and seams, and, uh, and hopefully it will you know go the distance. And Hayden Gavitt, five foot nine at that quarterback, he steps into some big shoes, having to replace Michael Eubank, our Player of the Year last year, who's now at Arizona State, but definitely some talent there. You know, Hayden Gavitt will be his his uh, his coming out party, so to speak. You know, got a chance to uh, show what he can do, and then some young receivers that we think will be pretty special. And then the receivers, you know, they're they're going to be a little tested. They got to transfer Isaac Crandall from Roosevelt, and then Chase Cravache got a little bit of playing time with the varsity last year in some of those uh, late ending game, or late ending games. Good size should be able to keep that ball moving for Centennial. Now you mentioned they lost to Palo Alto in the state bowl game last year. Is this a team, despite the turnover in the, in the you know skill positions, is this a team that you could see making another run to a state championship game once again? Yeah, it'll be real interesting. It all comes down to that beginning of the season. They have an extremely tough non-league schedule. And if you're going to make it to a st state bowl game, you likely have to go undefeated. So with them having to go through St. Bonaventure, who starts number six in the state, and then having to go to Modern Day, and then also facing Chaparral, they're going to be tested. You lose one, you might still be in the mix. If they lose two games, there's going to be no state bowl game there for them. And we'll find out exactly where we're at in those first three games, you know, in preparation for league. And uh, league is no slouch by any by any means. But you know, playing those games are great for us. It's great for our kids. It's great for the program. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to see how we stack up against the best teams out there, and especially teams like you know, it's fun to play these teams from other sections to kind of see what they're about. You know, we got a northern section, and we got the Pac-5, of course, and then you know, Chaparral's in our division. But uh, it's just nice to go out and play some other people. And St. Bonnie, that's week one, right? Not week zero, week one right, on week September 9th. Right, week one on September 9th. And that's going to be a real test. Uh, Centennial, number five in the state. St. Bonnie's number six in the state. That's going to be probably the big showdown everyone's going to be keeping their eyes on early just to see where those two teams are at. And how does the schedule play in Centennial's favor, right? A lot of those big games that you're talking about mm -hmm. are going to be right here on their home field, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you couldn't have probably asked for a better schedule if you were Matt Logan. You go St. Bonaventure, you open here. Chaparral, a team that they are going to see in the non-league game and could potentially see in the Inland Division Championship game here as well. Even though the last time those two teams faced each other here at Centennial, Chaparral did win that game. But then Norco, always that big rivalry game. you got to remember, Norco's the only team that has beaten Centennial in league play in the last 12 years. But that game is here at Centennial. But again, last time Norco and Centennial played here, Norco won that game. So home field advantage may not always be the best thing for Centennial. But I think if you were going to prefer where do you want to play those games, you want to be at home. And Centennial has three of their four toughest games right here. All right, so talking about Norco, could Norco be that team that you see 
maybe has that outside chance of being that team to knock off Centennial this season. Yeah, I talked to Coach uh, Todd Garrett and told him, you know, I'm picking him like second in the league. And he was like, oh, I don't know if I want to be ranked that high kind of expectations. He has a very young group of players, but a lot of people who got playing time last year, you talk about Colton Gerhardt, the younger brother of Toby Gerhardt and Garth Gerhardt, starting at quarterback. He started as a freshman last year. Great dual threat quarterback, can run the ball, got the power almost like his older brother did. And he's got a good arm and the receivers are there this year. And then running back wise, Joseph GB at running back, got a lot of playing time when Kelsey Young got hurt last year and almost rushed for a thousand yards. So two guys who are skilled there. And when we talk about, you know, offensive lines, usually you always go to Norco and they they average six foot three, 280 across the board on that offensive line. So they're going to definitely have some good talent to run behind there. The big question for them is going to be defensively. Can they keep points from coming off the board? You know, last year they got shut out 45 nothing to Centennial. So they got to make up a big gap right there. But I definitely believe they have the talent. All of them who have a year under the belt. They should be able to give Centennial the best challenge in league this year. So like Centennial, Norco is going to be big up front and maybe give Gerhardt some time to throw or maybe a Jigby some uh, some lanes to run in? Yeah, I definitely think it's still a running-based offense, even though they operate out of the spread. But I, I think, you know, Todd Gerhardt's predict, predicting that Joseph Jigby could rush for 2,000 yards and that his son Colton could throw and pass for 1,000 yards apiece. So it, off, it could be an explosive offense, and especially behind a huge offensive line, you know, you definitely got to think they're going to have holes to run through and time to throw the ball. All right, so if we have uh, Centennial, pretty much the unanimous number one, Norco at number two, how do you kind of see the rest of the Big Eight falling out? You know, you got to like Roosevelt, and uh, right now with their starting quarterback, Aaron Crone, back for a third season, he threw for over 2,000 yards and 23 touchdowns last year, so he gives good experience at that spot. And they have a, you know, a talented receiver in Brandon Zuidema, who um, you know, was their number two receiver last year, but he's a guy who could definitely put up 1,000 yards receiving. They're a little thin on the defensive side of the ball, especially up front. They graduate a lot of guys, but they're very talented in the secondary. Elijah Mitchell, uh, who was a track star for Roosevelt, will be a junior this year. He should definitely be a player to look out for. And in a league where you have Centennial, Santiago teams that like to throw the ball, and you want that strong secondary. So Roosevelt, a program on the rise. They're still making small strides. They won their first playoff game last year. This is the year that they feel they need to make that big step up because a big time senior class who's looking to improve a lot there. And North right now proves to be the big wild card team. A lot of talent there. They went two and eight last year, kind of disappointing, but it was the first year that Mark Paredes returned back to coach at North. So he's kind of getting his feet wet, getting his new system back in there. But a lot of talented players returning. Justin Georgie is back for his third year at quarterback and Aaron Peck, one of the best receivers in the area, and Marcus Ba, a linebacker, who's only a junior, is definitely one of the top players to watch on defense in the area. So it sounds like out of, after Centennial Norco, it could be wide open. You like Roosevelt, you like North, but it could be uh, could be wide wide open across the board for the rest of the teams in the Big Eight. Yeah, and you can't you can't you know throw Santiago out of the mix. They have one of the most talented offenses. Michael Dar last year in his first year at Santiago threw for over 2,000 yards. A very talented quarterback out there, and in that, just like Norco and Centennial, huge offensive line over there. They have three uh, 300 pounders led by Isaiah Falasa, who's headed to UCLA. So Santiago offense. Definitely there, but they gave up 36 points a game last year. A lot of those key guys are gone on defense. So again, how does defense come around? That's going to be the big key for a lot of teams not named Centennial <laughs> of whether or not they can compete. How well has their defense improved? All right, so overall, EPJ, you think uh, Centennial is going to run it, go undefeated in league play and make another state title run? You know, I definitely think, you know, they are going to run the table, I think, yeah. right now in the Big 8 League. I still think there is, while they lost a lot, the gap is still, you know, a little big. Will Norco slowly progress and make up those strides? I think they're there. Uh, whether or not Centennial has that state title game in them, it's going to depend on how quickly these newcomers get thrown into the fire. They have to beat St. Bonaventure. That's going to be their, when, when the State Bowl Committee looks at everything, they're going to look at that game. And that's got to be the marquee win for them. If they can win that game and, and run the table the rest of the way, I think they're in the State Bowl game, possible Open Division Bowl game, which they've never played for. So. That's definitely the big, I think, the, a big thing on their minds. And I think a lot of these players who were in that game last year definitely want to get back there and make up for that disappointment of losing to Palo Alto last year. 
So very similar to like the BCS in college football, they're going to be under the microscope from, from week one, right, against St. Bonaventure. Every game is going to be critical, especially those non-league games that you talked about that are uh, against some of the top teams in the state. Yeah, I mean, when they, if they can win those three games, St. Bonaventure, Modern Day, and Chaparral, and knowing you're going to have to go through Norco and Roosevelt, and in the playoffs, potentially going through a Redlands East Valley, an Upland, they're going to have definitely the strength on there. But they also have to look out there and say, you know, what is Servite doing out there? Servite starts number two in this state right now, and they're the team that got the open division bowl game a bid over Centennial last year. Another team with a tough schedule, plays in a tough league. Definitely, like you said, everyone's under the microscope. You gotta play those tough teams, and you gotta play well against them, and sometimes you gotta have convincing wins to do that. So I think definitely Centennial gotta come out firing right off the bat. They did it last year. Can they do it again this year with some new faces in the lineup? All right, so there you have it. EPJ going with Centennial to do it once again. The learning curve will be fast. They will be tested early on, but hopefully uh, we'll see if the Huskies can make another run towards a state bowl game. From Centennial High School in Corona, I'm Pep Fernandez and EPJ and HS Game Time.